Hello, in this lecture I'm going to cover the jury test for stability evaluation. So I'm going to give you some initial introduction, so motivation into why this is important. We'll then cover the jury test, the mathematics behind it, the theory, and then I've got an example that I'll run through. So after this um, lecture you should be able to understand the importance of stability for a closed loop control system and understand how then to undertake the steps to evaluate the stability of a closed loop control system using the jury test. So it's very important to understand the dynamics of a closed loop control system or to even understand the dynamics of an open loop system um, and then control on top of that. So I've got a couple of videos here for you to watch in your own time. So in YouTube, if you type in what's next for Boeing, um, watch that video. It's very um, interesting in terms of Boeing redesigning their aircraft. And sadly, the um, the redesign um, ended up with the actual system becoming, un, un well, the Boeing plane becoming unstable and, all, unfortunately, um, large um, fatalities. Also, the Leicester helicopter uh, video, helicopter crash is an interesting one where there was um, um, issues with the sensors and, and yeah, as a, as a result, the system became unstable. So I've got here as well, it's just a... It's just a pendulum. It's trying to do ang angle control, and again, that's potentially going unstable. So, what we can undertake is a model-based design approach. Um, so, if we mathematically model uh, the the system, if we get a mathematical model of the system, we can then effectively make or explore changes to the model. So, we can change parameters, change parts of the model, um, introduce feedback control change the control, configure the controller, see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and yeah, and effectively kind of introduce, well, allow you to kind of do what if scenarios. So if if you kind of, the model based design approach is, is obviously very um, useful because it's in terms of, um, in terms of obviously physical testing, it's far easier to test something in simulation rather than in practice and not identifying potential issues early on in the design process, such as with the Boeing plane, can lead to the system potentially going unstable and failure of the system. So what have we done so far? So in the previous videos, this is pretty much what we've been looking at, or in the previous lectures, this is what we've been looking at quite a lot. So what we've got is a pure time, pure discrete time equivalent of the sample data control system and the closed loop control system being given via this. So we're initially, we're looking at the use of just a proportional control gain, but in a few lectures time, we will actually look at a full proportional integral and derivative kind. And the aim of the closed loop control system is to be designed such that this, the closed loop control system remains stable. What I mean by stable is when we looked at the final value theorem, whereby you had a system response that kind of maybe looked something like that. So effectively you have this transient space phase, and then it goes into steady state. Unstable, what I spoke about earlier, when the, effectively the response grows. So we looked in the previous video at the Z-plane. So you can see here, this is the Z-plane. And we know that we want to locate, for example, a pair of complex conjugate poles. We want them to remain within the unit circle for a stable system when we're in the discrete time domain. So what we're going to look at is the use of the jury test. It's similar to the Ralph Herbert's approach um, that it effectively determines whether the roots of the polynomial lie within the unit circle in this case. In the Ralph Herbert's it's whether the poles um, were on the left half of the S-plane. For this it's whether the poles will, 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 will are within for a given closed control system are within the unit circle. So for a discrete time control system, this is an important point. A proportional control gain, Kp, value, will move the poles to outside the unit circle. And we'll see that we'll see that in more detail in the next video. And we'll also see it when we look at the root locus. So this is some background to the jury test. So populating the jury table. So this is the jury table. It's going to look a little bit confusing initially because it just looks like rows of um, A's, B's, C's, whatever. Um, but what we effectively take is the characteristic equation. So the characteristic equation is in your transfer function. If we go back a couple of slides, 
it's your transfer function here and it's the effectively the denominator equal to zero so when we equal the denominator to zero that is our characteristic equation in this case here you can just see the characteristic equation here is just given in general form but an example in a few few well in a few minutes time where i'll actually kind of have a characteristic equation and we'll run through an example this equation here so equation 3 2 is useful because this tells us how many rows we effectively need to use for the jewelry table so the equation is 2 multiplied by n where n is the highest order of the polynomial so if it was third order fourth order whatever that's what the n would be there so if it was fourth order so fourth order be two times four take away three and that would end hence equal five so that would tell us that we need to use five rows of the table one two three four five okay so that's initial um background when we're populating the table what we can initially do is from the characteristic equation we can get straight away rows one and rows two and you'll see this when we go for an example so straight away you can get rows one and row two straight from the from the characteristic equation rows row three you'll then need to determine based on equation three three and then row four you can effectively construct based on row three because if you look at row one and two you'll see this in a little while row one when you populate it row two is just row one flipped the other way around and likewise with row three row four is just row three flipped around then to, to determine row five so if you had a system that's fourth order that we've just spoken about where we needed to use five rows this is then the equation that you would use to determine the values within the um within this um within this row here if obviously we had a third order so if we had a third order so if we go back here so if it's two to the uh, uh, two times three because it's third order, take away three so it'd be three so effectively we'd use three rows so if we go back to here that means that we'd obviously only go up to that up to here and we obviously we wouldn't then need to use equation three four so i'm not going to go through these equations at the moment i'm going to wait until we go for an example because it might get confusing in terms of what this k term is okay that might be confusing but other than that, other than the k term, you can see that it's just the determinant of a 2 by 2. And it's just here a determinant of a 2 by 2 here, where the 2 by 2 is obviously just an area within the jewellery table. And you can obviously see the k here, the k here. And again, I'm going to save this till we get to an example because it can be a, bit, a, little, a little bit confusing. So there's some, in terms of the jewellery test, there's some necessary and sufficient conditions. So the following are necessary and sufficient conditions for a stable system. So the absolute value of AN, so AN if you look is there, must be less than A0. So A0 you'll see is a value in the table when we populate it. So AN must be less than that, the absolute value. Rule uh, condition two, the, for the polynomial Z, what you need to effectively do on this rule is just replace all the Zs with one and then simplify it. And that final term that you get must be greater than zero for this condition to be satisfied. So you replace all the z's with one, simplify it, and if that, that the final product of that is greater than zero, you know that your system is well is is it meets that condition, and you can just put a tick by it. Then condition three. So what you need to do for this condition is effectively replace all the z's with minus one. And then again, simplify it and get the product of that. And if you've got a, for example, a fourth order, so you've got n is even, or if you had n is odd, you need to apply these two different rules. So if it's fourth order, you need to make sure the product of this is greater than zero for that condition to be satisfied. And if it's an odd order, so three, you need to make sure that your condition here is, well, the product here is less than zero. Okay, so just be aware of that, that's sometimes that students get a bit confused on. It's unlikely that you'll do an example um, using this that's of, well, if it's of second order, you wouldn't need to, you can just work out the poles, and you can just work out whether the poles are within the unit circle, so you wouldn't do a second order, and probably a fifth, you might do a um, sorry, in fifth order, but anyway, it's likely that we'll just stick to third and fourth orders. And then the final condition is, 
And this obviously depends on whether you got third or fourth order. So if it's fourth order, you'd obviously use both of these conditions because C and my that's effectively that rule is based on row five. And this rule here is this one here is based on row three. So if it was obviously third order, you use the first one, fourth order, you're going to use two, both of them. So the absolute value of BN minus one must be greater than the absolute value of B zero. And then this, the absolute value of CN minus two must be greater than C zero. So now let's move on to an example. So what we've got here is a characteristic equation of a feedback control system being given by this. Okay, so it's equal to zero. What the first thing I need to notice is the order of the system. So it's um, fourth order. And the, if you recall from the previous slides, when we looked at the general form, what I've done is I've just I've written the general form for this above polynomial. And you'll see straight away, you can obviously recognize A0 is 1, A1 is minus 1.2, A2 is 0 0.07, A3 is 0 0.3, and then um, minus A4 is minus 0 0.008, or, or A4 is minus 0 0.08. So then you can see then the coefficients are uh, written down there. The number of rows we need to use because n is 4 and as we went through earlier, 2 times two times 4 take away 3, it's going to be 5 rows. So it means we need to use 5 rows at the table. So you can see straight away I've done n um, a n which is going to be a4 and you know a4 is um, a4 is effectively minus 0 0.08. Um, a n minus 1 so a3 so you know the value is 0 0.3. A n minus 2, which we know is, is 2, so 0 0.07. A n minus 3, which is A1, which you know is minus 1.2. And then A0, you know here, is 1. And then you'll notice that row is populated. And you'll notice, as I said, row 2 is effectively just A0, A1, A2, A3, A4. So it's just the row 1 flipped the other way around. So that's populate, the rows 1 and 2 are now populated. So what we can first of all do is just check the initial conditions. So this is here is the rule that we said. So A subscript N, the absolute value of that must be less than A0. So in, in this case, we, we know that um, A N is equal to A4, which is um, 0 0.08. And we know that that is less than 0 from, from the A0 because A0 is 1. Hence, we know that the first condition is satisfied. Second condition, so if we replace, if we've got this polynomial here, and we place all the z's with 1, okay, we simplify it, and the final term value we'll get is 0 0.08. And again, this must be greater than 0, if you remember from the initial condition, hence the second condition is satisfied. Then condition 3, because we've got n even, the, the, the kind of the final value, the product of, when you replace all the z's with minus 1, must be greater than 0. So again, what I've done here is done that. And you can see the final value we get is 1.99 when you just um, simplify that or add and subtract these terms. So we know that is greater than 0, hence the third term is satisfied. Then we move on to using equation 3, 3. Because what we've got now is, um, well, we've, con we've satisfied the first three conditions. Now what we want to do is, is test the fourth condition. And to test the fourth condition, we need to populate rows 3, 4, and 5 in the table. So if you use an equation 3, 3, so this one I used earlier, although I didn't go through it in a great amount of detail. And what I'm going to do now is explain this equation to you. I'm not going to go through every one because you can see the maths yourself. But BN minus 1, okay, so if we're looking initially here, so BN minus 1, we know that n's 4 because the highest order is 4, hence bn minus 1 is equal to b3. And what we effectively say is the value of that there, of that value there, is effectively our k value. So you can see here b subscript 3, okay, so our k value is 3. So then when we use this equation, okay, so we're now going to go, okay, we're going to say a n, which is a4. I'm going to say a n, where n is 4, take away 1, take away k, which k is 3. So effectively that's there is a 0. 
then a0, okay, and then we say a k plus 1, where k we know is 3, so it's a k, oh, so it's a3 plus 1, so effectively that's a4. So we're taking the term from a4, taking the value from a0, and hence you end up with that there. Then to take the determinant, if you remember, it's effectively just that term here, multiply by that term, so take away this term, multiply by that term. Subtract that from that, and then you should get this value here. And you can see there it's populating the table down here. And then to work out the rest of the values, it's exactly the same. So it's bn minus 2, so it's b4, because four, because obviously that's that. And when I'm saying this bn minus 1, obviously bn minus 1, bn minus 2 has come from there, bn minus 3 has come from there, and bn minus 4 has come from there. So b4 minus 2 is b2, therefore k is 2. Then if we know k is 2, again, just use this formula up here. And what you'll notice is every time these values here, here, and here are always the same. It's always going to be a4 and a0. The only values that are going to change are these values here, because what it's changing is as a function of k. So because obviously you're going a n minus 1, a n minus 2, a n minus 3, a n minus 4, and the product of that is obviously your k value. Your k value is obviously changing, and hence the value that you pick in here will also change. So I've gone through all the calculations. I'm not going to go through another one. And you can see here I've got these values, and you can see here I've added them into the table. Then you can see, as I said to you earlier, row 3 is given by that. Row 4 is effectively just row 3 flipped over the other way, because you can see B3, B2, B1, B0. Then what we've got to finally do then is, um, is populate row 3. So it's exactly the same as the process we did on the previous slide. However, now we've just got the notation of CK. But again, the formula is given here. It's exactly the same process. So CN minus 2. So it's going to be C4 minus 2. So C2. And we know that 2 is K. And as we saw previously, yeah, this here and here and here are always going to be the same. And these values here, just well, effectively here, here, and here, and also here, here, and here, just change as a function of obviously the k value changing, because the k value is 2, 1, and 0. Okay, so once you've got that, you basically just lift the values from the table, work out the determinant, so that, multiply by that, take away that, multiply by that, simplify it, and that's the value we get. And you can see then, I've just populated the table with C2, C1, and C0. So I now have the whole jewelry table populated. So the fourth um, sufficient and necessary condition I'm now just going to go through. So bn minus 1, so we know that obviously n's 4. So if we go to bn minus 1, so it's b3, is that. So the absolute value of that is 0 0.9936, and that must be greater than 0 0.2040, which it is. So we've satisfied that. Cn minus 2. So we know that Cn minus 2 is given by that. The absolute value of that is 0 0.946. And that must be greater than C0, which is this value. And we know it is, and hence that condition there is satisfied. So all the four conditions have been satisfied for this particular closed loop control system when we've evaluated the characteristic equation using the jewelry test. So what this is telling us is the poles are within the unit circle. They're within the unit circle and hence we've got a stable system. So in summary, the importance of stability for a closed loop control system has been detailed. So it's important to understand your system and understand your controller and understand that your controller can effectively compensate for the, the, the system and the, the, the environment effectively that the system is operating in. And what we've gone through is the steps for understanding the stability evaluation of a closed loop control system. So you, the use of the jewellery test, effectively, if we were to mathematically model a system, and we're going to get on to system identification, how we do that um, in, in practice, if we were to mathematically model a system, and then to configure a control system, if, um, uh, in this case, we're just looking at proportional control gain at the moment, and then just to double, just to check that the poles are in within the unit circle. So the next steps, we're going to look at the jewellery test for determining the proportional control gain range to give a stable closed loop control system.
because for a, for a given proportional control gain, the poles can effectively move outside of the unit circle and hence create an unstable system. So thanks for listening. If you have any questions, please email me.